Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, another new series on our topic of political Islam. This is Al Fadi. And this particular video series that we are going to start, myself and my guest here in studio, Dr. Bill Warner, is going to be probably a little bit on the tough side. And what I mean by that is um, we're not going to hold back information. Uh, the concept of political correctness is not going to work here this time because we're going to be sharing what we are discovering or uncovering, in this case, from the primary sources of Islam about a very sensitive topic. And the topic is the status of women in Islam. That alone should get everybody's attention. And I say this because I have encountered a number of converts to Islam who are women, by the way. And the first thought, uh, thought that comes to my mind is like, do they even know what Islam teaches about women? Now, I know what's going to happen if I ask a question like this. They are probably going to lecture me on the fact that Islam elevated the status of women. Islam made me a better woman than prior to that. Islam treats me very well, and the list can go on and on and on. Now, I'm not sitting here to say there are no truth to some of these claims that Islam definitely is going to treat a mother, for instance, in a nice way. But what about the treatment of a wife in Islam? What about the treatment of the daughter in Islam? And the list can go on and on and on. <clears throat> you get the idea. But let us take it one show at a time. And we are going to share with you, myself and my guest, Dr. Bill Warner, enough information in this, what I call, introductory, basically, series on the topic of women in Islam. And I think by the time we're done, you will get the gist of what we're trying to say. So hang tight, fasten your seatbelt. The ride is going to be really rough pretty soon here. Bill, welcome, my friend. And I hope this introduction kind of you know, will lead you your, uh, into your own encounter with the topic of women in Islam. First of all, tell us, you know, your own relationship with women in general. Well, when you and I talked as to what we were going to talk about during this series, I said I wanted to be one of them as women. <clears throat> I was raised by two women, have two daughters, married to the same woman for 56 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. So as a result, I'm very sensitive to how women are treated. They've treated me well, and I can't stand their abuse. So when I started just reading Islam, one of the things that ran into my head was, it's like, first off, there were th I noticed three different views of women. There's the view of the woman as a mother in which she is elevated. There's the view of Judgment Day in which they're equal on Judgment Day. But then the third category is that women are subjugated. And the subjugation bothered me. And by the way, one of the examples of subjugation is this. My wife nursed our children. And yet there's a verse in the Quran which says that I, as a male, am supposed to tell her how long the children should be nursed. I'm like, what? You crazy? Why would I ever tell a woman how long to nurse a baby? And yet there's a verse there. That's what I call it, subjugates the women. So I got interesting, I like to measure things, and so I says, let's take the Quran, let's take the Hadith, and let's pull out every verse that deals with women, and every Hadith that deals with women. And let's put them into four piles. One pile is, it doesn't say anything about women at all, they're just there, neither good, bad, or indifferent. Then the other category is women are subjugated, women are equal, and then women are elevated. So I pulled them all out and I created a bar chart of this. And they're similar, but not exactly the same. Let's talk about what elevates women. As a mother, they're elevated. That's right. And on Judgment Day, they, have to, they can be judged equal to men, but there's a little fine print here in the detail, which is one of the ways they're going to be judged is how well they obeyed their husband. Absolutely. That's one so of the even criteria. the verse of equality contains subjugation. And then the last is just complete subjugation. The most infamous, which we'll have to discuss, is 434. I know. I know which one you're headed to. But I mean, just to add to what Bill mentioned, for instance, let's go to the Quran. The Quran says, mankind fear your Lord who created you of a single soul and from it created its mate. That's in the Quran, chapter 4, verse 1. You get the impression right away, 
come on, there is equality here, you know? Yes. I mean, it's a benign verse. I mean, it's almost like the Bible saying he made you male and female, right. you know, created an image of God, you know, he made them male and female. Uh, you know, all this is fine, you know, but you heard a number right now, chapter 4, verse 34. Wait until we get there, and you tell me if there is equality in that particular verse. Bill, what basically grabbed your interest or attention into specifically the status of women in Islam? I mean, what, was there an incident? Was there something that, you know, made you feel like, man, I, I need to know, know more about this? Well, I didn't at first. I... My study of Islam started <clears throat> with the three texts themselves, Quran, Sirah, Hadith. And I approached them just as, I don't know, what's in them? But as I studied them, it was very clear that women have a, a position of subjugation. <clears throat> Let's put it this way. There's no verse in which the woman is in order to beat the man. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there are such things for women. So anyway, I like to say, I wanted to measure the difference and distinction because, as I say, my personal history is I'm very sensitive to how women are treated. I have daughters, a wife, was raised by a mother and grandmother, and I want to see them treated well. And some of the ways I would, let's put it this way, I would not want my, the women in my family to be treated as though they were Muslim women. Right. I mean, I, I understand. Uh, I mean, I grew up, of course, in a Muslim family. I have a mother, I have sisters, and I can tell you, uh, you know, one of my concerns about when I decided in, in the 70s to go for jihad in Afghanistan is that my mother forbade me from such an idea. She kind of like uh, uh, wanted me to, uh, uh, to basically respect her decision, uh, never to disobey her. And it is my concern about her status because it's, there is a hadith that says, you know, the uh, paradise is under the feet of mother. I was concerned that maybe God is going to punish me for disobeying her. Mm -hmm. What if I go and fight and die and my death is not as a martyr anymore and I died basically as someone that God uh, will view differently? Because there are hadith about martyrs that God also didn't send straight to paradise because he felt like they didn't do things correctly. You know, so, so that was my concern. Um, but uh, you, you look at the uh, woman in Islam as a wife, all of a sudden, I will begin to feel superior naturally. Now, where does that come from? Let me read a verse, for instance, you're familiar with. You mentioned already chapter 4, verse 34. I'm not going to read the whole thing because you know it's damaging. Right. But we are going to read just a portion of it. Men have authority over women because Allah has made the one superior to the other. How Let's clear stop can it right be? here. You know? How clear can it be? Exactly. That's the beginning of that verse, actually. Uh, what did you find in terms of that superiority in your study? Well, I found that what it says is it's not just this one verse which says it's superior, but it's just ways in which the man can subjugate the woman again and again and again. As a matter of fact, I think without, if I could view my original notes, I think in every case in which it's a man and a woman are mentioned in the same verse, the man is subjugating the woman. And by the way, although we're, we may talk about slavery later, the one in which the women are treated the absolute worse are the sex slaves. That's right. Women I mean, who your right hand possesses. Exactly. I mean, let me, let me interject also, like, um, in the Quran, in, in Islam, I should say, the Quran has commentators. Mm -hmm. Those are Islamic scholars that studied the Quran and they understand the reason, for instance, why a verse was revealed. Uh, they have knowledge of what Muhammad says about that particular topic or maybe that particular verse. And some of them are considered to be one of the greatest renowned scholars in Islam, like Ibn Kathir, for instance, right. like Tabari, like Qurtubi, like Arazi. Zamakhshari, and, and the list can go on and on. These are scholars that studied the Quran from its early inception. We're talking, you know, the uh, uh, 9th century, 10th century, 13th century. Look at Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir is a Salafi scholar. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I like what you said earlier. You told me, you know, if I want to be a Muslim, I'll be a Salafi. Yes. Why? Because the Salaf, just mm. by their term, you know, by the name, meaning like the followers of Muhammad and his companions. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're saying that's the perfect model of 7th century Islam if you become a Salaf. Look at what the Salafi scholar Ibn Kathir, who is, by the way, the student of Ibn Taymiyyah. I mean, the name Ibn Taymiyyah is a notorious when it comes to jihad and many other 
rulings concerning how to rebel against ungodly rulers and, and so on and so forth. Ibn Kathir in his commentary about chapter 4 verse 34 of the Quran said, Men are superior to women and man is better than woman. A man is better than a woman. Bill, how should a woman feel about something like this? Well, <clears throat> I'd be outraged because most women have met a lot of men and they don't draw from their conclusion that they're all better than them, as a matter of fact. So if I were a woman, I'd be outraged. Absolutely. I agree with you. You know, you have people like Razi, for instance, uh, Zamakhshari, who, by the way, are not really that hardliner. In their commentary, for instance, on one of the chapters, chapter four of the Quran, by the way, is known as the chapter of women. Right, exactly. you know, so you want to learn a lot about women, just go there. Or there is chapter 65, the divorce one, also known as the miniature uh, you know, woman chapter. You, go, you can go there and learn also about the treatment of women during divorce and other things. Look what these supposedly more moderate, you know, moderate in their interpretation. They're saying the male share is that of two female. Here is talking about the inheritance. One of the ways that women in Islam, as you know, Bill, which we probably will talk about it in a little bit, that they are inferior to men, that if a father dies, notice I'm not saying parents, woman dies, you know, I'm talking about father. If the father dies and you have one son and one daughter, I'm simplifying it right now, guess who gets the bulk of the share of that inheritance? The man. That's twice as much of his sister. Mm -hmm. So in his comment about that, this is what he says. The reason why God ordained it this way, Allah ordained it this way, he says, because man is more perfect than the woman in creation. That's interesting. How clear can it be? I mean, <laughs> we, we keep coming back to this because sometimes people say, well, it all depends on how you interpret it. No matter how you interpret it, it comes out with a man on top. Absolutely. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, you travel a lot and, and you've been involved with uh, the, the study of Islam and your own ministry is called the Center for Political Islam. Um, have you encountered uh, any Muslim men or women who were willing to engage in this dialogue with you? And what has been their view on things like this? Actually, I've never met a Muslim who wanted to discuss women with me as I think about it. Uh, nor do I know, no, it's never happened in my life. Because I think that for most Muslim males, well, I'm not, sh I'm, I'm guessing here, so I won't enter into that. I'm just speculation. But we do know that the doctrine is consistent again and again and again. The woman is to be, sub <clears throat> to be subjugated to the male because he's better than her. It's like I say, that out, that's just wrong. Absolutely. And you know, um, there is something that comes to my mind real quickly that, uh, uh, you know, just, you know, in the last maybe a decade or so, there is something called the, uh, family court, family Sharia law court, basically. And there is few of those, uh, you know, if you call 80 few, uh, that are found, for instance, in the UK. Mm -hmm. And recently I came across some articles that are saying that the authority over there are starting to feel troubled by the rulings in there that they felt like women are not treated justly. Well, wait a minute. This court is applying the teaching of Islam, actually. They're not really coming up with their own ruling. No. They're using the standard procedure yes. in inheritance, in divorce, in custody. So I find it interesting that sometimes governments in the West, they would allow things like this without understanding what is the <clears throat> teaching going to imply. And in this case, they felt like the treatment of women was unfair when in fact it's perfectly fair according to the teaching of Sharia law. The question is, whose justice are you talking about? Exactly. Are we talking about the justice of the West, in which men and women are viewed as equal? Or are we talking about the justice of Sharia, in which they're inferior or superior? So it is justice that's being dispensed. And I find the most troubling thing you say here is that political officials in UK have allowed this to happen. It didn't just happen. In every case, they unlock the door and open it and says, come on in. Absolutely. Because we don't want to be Islamophobes, so if you want to have your own courts, well, sure, have your own courts, but they're, they've never read the label of what they're buying. Exactly, and what they're hearing now, they probably began to get some pressure from others who are troubled by, you know, they have maybe a Muslim friend who is a female, and she was complaining about how the ruling was against her. But, you know, there is more to the story. They're probably the Muslim woman herself didn't know that that's what the law says, the Sharia law says, you know, that she should be treated this way. So this is what we mean by... We're uncovering things for you. It's really not up to the Muslim man or the Muslim woman in the street to tell you what they ought to, how they ought to be treated. 
the judges of Sharia law uh, or Sharia court decide based on the primary sources. Mm -hmm. That's the Quran, that's the Hadith, and the interpretation of those. And those don't change. Exactly. So one of the things about Islamic justice is what was, what was just in the year 632 is just today. You consider it timeless. Basically. Exactly. As a matter of fact, I heard one comic say that Islam is a time machine which creates the force of putting all civilizations into the year 632. It is. Uh, bringing things back to the 7th century. Exactly. Speaking. That is the purpose of Sharia. I mean, look at uh, areas like Afghanistan, if I dare to say that. Mm. You know, uh, the, you know, the invasion of the Soviets happened in the 70s, late 70s, 1979. Uh, you know, the band of brothers that was called the Mujahideen and later evolved into what we know today as the Al-Qaeda and the alliance with the Taliban and things like that. And they ruled for a while, actually. If you go to Afghanistan today, it's nowhere near the Afghanistan that used to be. It leaped backward, not yes. forward. There was, it's been around on the internet, but you have pictures of like women in the 30s and 40s in Iran, in Afghanistan, and you couldn't really tell where they were taken from. But now then, you can easily spot, oh, the woman in the burqa, the, you can't even see her face. She's a Muslim. Yeah. And you know, uh, the Taliban's biggest beef with women is the idea of them going to school and having education. I mean, they're totally anti this. Now, is that equality? Well. It, might, it may be inequitable according to what we say, but according to the rules of Islam, it's totally equal. That's right, exactly. And that's what Bill is trying to say. Who's saying what and where are you getting your opinion from? Uh, I know we are emotional human beings and we think rationally sometimes based on the times we're living. Just because someone lives in the West and they have freedom of choice and freedom of religion, that means nothing under Sharia law. In fact, Sharia law will tell you, you are free to live under Islamic law according to what Islamic law dictates. Yes. That's the freedom, you know? You're right. You're free to live under our law as long as you abide by it. You're free to be subjugated. Right. If you, that's what we're about. And of course, we covered this earlier, that's what Islam is about, subjugation. Absolutely. Well, Bill, you can tell this is a deep topic, and I think maybe next time we'll venture a little bit more into Chapter 434 and other related matters uh, that deals with women and how they are being treated according to the teaching of Islam in general. Thank you again, everyone, for watching us. Hopefully you'll find this series to be extremely uh, powerful, you know, and helpful uh, to your interactions with female uh, from a Muslim background. Sympathize with them, by the way. You are going to hear some Muslim woman say some outrageous things to you. They may tell you, I'm happy with the way Islam treat me. I'm happy with the fact that uh, the God of Islam told me that it's okay to, uh, uh, you know, have this much inheritance or my husband have this uh, authority over me. So don't be surprised because in their view, I'm being obedient to the teaching, uh, the divine teaching of my God. And that's why they may share things like this or opinions like this. So hang tight. We'll see you next time. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Please like our video. And we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and it will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.